we are continuing in our series through 1 Corinthians. Uh, we're well over halfway now, but we'll go into next year, probably Easter next year is where we're going to finish up uh, looking through Corinthians. Today, we're in a passage in 1 Corinthians that, uh, in, in just researching for it this week, I heard more than a few commentators say this is one of the trickiest passages in all of Scripture. Some people just throw up their hands and say, we can't do it. Others say, no, I am incredibly confident this is exactly what it means. And then somebody else would be as incredibly confident and say that it means something very, very different. So we have a little bit of work to do today uh, to get through our passage. It is, um, it's in Scripture. It was originally to the church in Corinth. If you haven't been around for the rest of the um, letter to the church in Corinth, uh, <clears throat> this, is a, this was a church of converts, Mostly not Jewish converts, but mostly Gentile converts. In the culture in Corinth were uh, these people called sophists, people who were great speakers, philosophers, idea makers, and people would rally around these essentially first century influences. And the first century influences would say, this is how you should live. And Paul is writing this letter, it's actually, even though it's the first letter, it's the earliest letter we have, it's the second letter that he wrote to the church in Corinth, and he's essentially answering a bunch of questions that these people in Corinth have, saying, how can we live in a culture that does not see Jesus as king, that certainly doesn't want Jesus as a saviour, doesn't want him as their Lord, how do we live under the righteous rule and reign of Jesus? in a culture that is antagonistic at best and prone to violence at worst. And so Paul is writing this letter in response to them asking, how how should we live now that we know, now now that we belong to Jesus, now that he's purchased us at great expense, his own life and blood, how can we live for him? The next few chapters are are really about how do we operate as a church when we gather together? What do our gatherings look like? You'll see Paul in in this passage, he'll say, you guys are doing awesome in this regard. You're going great. And then next week you'll hear he says, but I do not praise you in this aspect of how you gather because you're doing it terribly. Now he'll tell us about spiritual gifts, about prophecy, uh, we're going to hear about speaking in tongues, not today, but over the next few weeks. Going to be talking about communion. Going to be talking about gender roles, unity. We're going to get to that great love passage, you know, the one that you hear at all the weddings. First Corinthians 13 is coming up in a couple of weeks. It's not about weddings, spoiler alert. It's going to be a big few weeks where, where Paul spends a couple of chapters. I mean, he didn't write chapter 11, chapter 12, um, but as it was broken up into these chapters, we have these few chapters where Paul is helping us understand what does it look like to step into God's way of living. And that will culminate uh, over in chapter 14 where he talks about God is a God of order, not a God of disorder. So he, he's not saying, now that you're free in Jesus, it's choose your own adventure and do whatever you like. But he's saying, I've made things for your good. I've made you for a particular telos, for a particular purpose to live in a particular way that will lead to your good and your flourishing and your joy and my glory. This is what God is is saying. So Paul spends these few chapters helping us understand what does that look like. So it's important, right? I mean, it's all important. It's been important. All of this scripture is God-breathed. All of it is, although written to the church in Corinth, it is also for us today. And so as we... Open up these scriptures. Let's also open up our hearts and our minds to the Spirit of God working among us. Let's pray. And so, Father, not just for this passage, but every time we open your scriptures, we need your help. We don't want to just import our own ideas. We don't want to bring our understanding and squeeze it into your word, but we want to be wholly shaped by what we read in these in these passages. So help us to become more like Jesus. Help us to love more like him and to love you more in him. 
Help us to relate to you more like he does. Help us to relate to one another like he does. And in every way, help us to be not only hearers of your word, but also doers. That, that we, our, our individual lives, our family lives, our church family life will look like what we see in your scriptures. Help us to have clarity today. In Jesus' holy name we ask. Amen. All right, let me read. This is the first half of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And <clears throat> if you hear things, you're like, what does that mean? Or that sounds weird or strange or very countercultural or he can't mean that. Uh, maybe even right from the very first verse. Uh, please, let's, let's sit in it for a second. Like you hear, he'll talk about angels and you'll be like, that's a head scratcher. Um, so let's, let's read it and then we'll do the work. Paul writes, imitate me as I also imitate Christ. That's not the controversial part, but that may be one of the most difficult verses in Scripture. Now I praise you because you remember me in everything and hold fast to the traditions just as I delivered them to you. But I want you, I want you to know that Christ is the head of every man and the man is the head of, of the woman and God is the head of Christ. Every man who prays or prophesies with something on his head dishonors his head. Every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head since that is one and the same as having her head shaved. For if a woman doesn't cover her head, she should have her hair cut off. But if it is, a dis but if it is disgraceful, disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, let her head be covered. A man should not cover his head because he is the image and glory of God. So too, woman is the glory of man. For man did not come from woman, but woman came from man. Neither was man created for the sake of woman, but woman for the sake of man. This is why a woman should have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels, obviously. In the law, that obviously wasn't in Scripture. That was my own addition. <clears throat> not addition, that's the wrong way. That's my comment. Uh, in the Lord, however, woman is not independent of man, and man is not independent of woman. For just as woman came from man, so man comes through a woman, and all things come from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a disgrace for him? But if a woman has long hair, it is her glory, for her hair is given to her as a covering. If everyone wants to argue about this, we have no other custom, nor do the churches of God. So let's unpack this passage. Firstly, it seems like this verse number one is a little out of place. It doesn't really belong with the rest. Or it kind of does. It's a, it really joins chapter 10 and chapter 11. Paul writes, imitate me even as I imitate Christ. If you remember chapter 10, I'll just read the last part. It says, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or Greeks or to the church of God, just as I also try to please everyone in everything, not seeking my own benefit, but the benefit of many, so that they may be saved. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. And so we see he gives a kind of a, a logical progression. He says, this is what I do. It's what I see Jesus doing. Now you can follow me as I follow him. If you need an example, if you're wondering what to do, remember the, the Corinthians are asking Paul, how, how then shall we live? What are we supposed to do? And he says, if you follow, follow these instructions, obey scripture, and if you want to see it in action, you can look at me. I think that's one of the most bold proclamations or statements anyone can make. If you want to know how to live, you can watch me. If you need an example of how to relate to God, see how I relate to God. If you want to see what a, what a good life is, you can watch me. You want to see a good man? Watch me. You want to see someone who is running hard after Jesus? Watch me. <laughs> this is a, that's a bold statement. 
here how he, here how he's kind of breaking this down. He says, you know, whatever you eat or drink, whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. So he's saying, uh, what do I do? This is Paul writing. I do everything for the glory of God, adding no offense to the gospel, not seeking my own benefit, but the benefit of many. So the Jews, his own people, the Greeks, the people who he's ministering amongst, and the church of God, like his own brothers and sisters in Jesus. He's saying, I work for the good of all of them. And then his end is, so that some may be saved. And so he, he's written this progression. He says, this is how you should live. <clears throat> if you need an example, watch me. This is how I live. And I live this way because I see this example in Jesus. This is how he lived. He lived. He did everything for the glory of God. He added no offense to the already offensive gospel. He didn't seek his own benefit, but the benefit of many for his own people, the Jews, for the Gentiles, everybody in the world, and for the family of God, those who are called to him, so that some would be saved. So Paul says, live this way. I live this way because Jesus lives this way. So Paul's life is kind of echoing or reverberating after Jesus's as he and he joins in the Holy Spirit in inviting the church in Corinth. And I think I believe the Holy Spirit inviting us as well into the same kind of life. Where not only do we imitate Paul in imitating, in imitating Jesus, or we can just imitate Jesus, but that we would actually be people who would say to others, if you want to know what this kind of life that brings God glory looks like, you can watch me. That's our, because he's saying, imitate me. And one of the ways we would imitate him in imitating Jesus, who says, Jesus says, live like this. And Paul's saying, Jesus said, live like this. And I'm saying, live like this, because I'm imitating after him. And so we, imitating after Paul, imitating after Christ, would also say, live like me, as I live for Christ. So Jesus says, follow me. Paul says, follow me. And we are to be a people who say, follow me. Not because we're awesome. Certainly not because we're perfect. Not because we are the point. But in everything, we are pointing to Jesus. It's like if you want to know what it looks like to follow Jesus, to run hard after him, follow me, look like me. So again, it's one of the, I think it's one of the boldest Hardest statements in Scripture. One of the most vulnerable, scary things to say to somebody <clears throat> is, you should copy me. Look over my shoulder, copy my work. You know the results that I'm getting in life? These should be the kind of results that you should go after. <laughs> it's not about waiting for some magical day in the future when you arrive. So I'm saying, yeah, aspirationally, yes, at some stage in the future, I know I'm going to just, just because I get older and older, it's going to magically happen that I will mature and some stage in the future, I will be mature enough and good enough to then be able to say to somebody, you can imitate me. But I think, it's, I think that's the, the opposite way of looking at it. I don't think it's a, we're going to achieve that thing one day and until we get there, we just plot along saying, don't look at me. Don't follow me. But rather we would say, okay, this is an invitation to step into and say, okay, <clears throat> I'm, I'm not there. My life isn't worth imitating right now. But instead of going, my life isn't worth imitating right now, so I can't say to someone, follow me, and I'll wait for some day in the future when I can, rather to say, oh, I'm going to say follow me and then do what I need to do to be a person worth following. Does that make sense? It's not a way for the magical day. You know, when the unicorn flies over the rainbow and glitters everywhere and the sun is shining, you're like, I've made it. Now you can follow me. Because you're not saying, be like me because I'm perfect. You're saying, I'm running hard after Jesus. You should too. So when you're struggling, you show people how to struggle well. When you're suffering, you show people how to suffer well. 
what we tend to do is we tend to go, I'm supposed to be mature and perfect. Therefore, when I'm struggling, when I'm sinning, when I'm suffering, I'm going to hide those things away from people. I'm going to withdraw from community. I'm going to say, don't follow me or not even give people an opportunity to follow me because I'm, I'm detached from the people. And once I can overcome this stuff, then I can come back and say, yeah, I'm doing all right. That's not what he's talking about. People need to see you repent when you sin. It's not about not sinning. I mean, ultimately, it's about not sinning. But in terms of saying, follow me as I follow Christ, Paul says, I'm, I've not yet attained perfection. That means he needs to repent. And when he repents, he is saying to someone, repent like I repent. He's not saying, be perfect like I'm perfect. Jesus says that. Paul says, repent like I repent. Follow Jesus like I follow Jesus. Run hard after him like I run after, hard after him. Love like I love. That's what we'll see in a couple of chapters time. This is what he's saying. He's putting your arm around someone and saying, I'm running hard after Jesus. Come run with me. You can keep in step with me. I'm, I'm setting the pace and you'll get there. So ask yourself, here's some homework for you. Ask yourself, ask your spouse and close friends, is my life worth imitating? This week will be the, one of the hardest questions you will have to ask, but it'll be so helpful because asking the people who love you, asking the people who know you, uh, you can get, I'm not saying you will get, but you can get a very good answer of, is my life a life worth imitating? If everybody in the church loved like, I, loved, loved like I love, would it be a church of love? If everyone in the church followed Jesus like I followed Jesus, would it be a church marked by our King Jesus? If everyone was generous like I'm generous, would we be living in a generous family? If everyone was full of joy like I'm full of joy? I'm not just, I'm not just trying to give you categories. I'm trying to help you understand. To ask someone who knows you well, is my life worth imitating? Again, not that you've attained perfection, but just to get a snapshot of where am I at now? Ask them, in what ways am I following after Jesus and becoming like him? Ask yourself and your friends, what changes could I make in my life to become somebody worth imitating? What needs to go and what needs to grow? Ask, who do I have in my life worth imitating and how can I follow them better? How can I get them to speak into my life? And then ask, who do I have in my life I can be an example to? Who's kind of in my sphere of influence, if you like? <clears throat> that, that could be people who are friends, co-workers, family members, neighbours. It could be lots of people. Ask yourself, what are some ways I can grow in my love for those people in order to get past my fear or my embarrassment or my laziness or my ego? And to the place where I can boldly say, not, not confidently necessarily, but boldly say, follow me as I follow Christ. There's some accountability in that as well, to say to somebody, follow me as I follow Christ. And then lastly, and well, not lastly, but last for today, ask yourself, how am I growing in my beholding of the beauty and the majesty of the glory of King Jesus? Apart from being central to all of life, this is really central to this endeavor today. That you're not trying to point people to yourself when you say, follow me. What you're trying to do is point people to Jesus. He, he is the author and the perfecter. He is the king and the savior. He is the glorious, beautiful, holy one of heaven. And we should only say to people, follow me as I follow Christ to the degree that we can help them behold the beauty and the majesty of Jesus. That's verse 1. Verse 2. It says, I want you to know, this won't be a very long sermon, by the way, just in case you're worried about that being verse 1. <clears throat> uh, 
This is kind of a, for the rest of this passage, and a chunk of chapter 14. I want to kind of do together when we get to chapter 14. I don't want to neglect this passage today, so I do want to, I do want to get into it today. But if you're not satisfied with the treatment today, please be patient and wait a few weeks till we get to chapter 14 because we'll come back to this and see how it relates to what Paul writes in chapter 14 as well. This is what he, this is what he says in chapter 11. I want you to know that Christ is ahead of every man and the man is ahead of the woman and God is ahead of Christ. So again, the, the Corinthian church church in Corinth, are wrestling with how do we live out our newfound allegiance to King Jesus meet a culture that doesn't share our values, doesn't see Jesus as king. A few chapters ago, Paul writes about relationships generally in the church. Uh, In the next few chapters, again, he's going to highlight what some of these relationships specifically look like in the church as we gather in various ways. What he's not saying here is that men generally uh, have authority or are the bosses over women generally. This passage, this verse, this passage has been used to promote incredibly unhealthy, unbiblical uh, relationships that dishonor God, subjugate women, cover over abuse. So we need to make sure we, we understand what it doesn't say doesn't say that men are the boss and women are subject to men, generally. That's not what it says. Depending on who you ask, uh, this word head here uh, means either authority or preeminence, like a prominence, or um, a a source. Uh, These are kind of, you know, there's a Venn diagram there of, of application, of what those words or how those words might use. They're not mutually exclusive. So someone could be an authority without being preeminent uh, or without being the source of the thing they have an authority over. Uh, Someone could be the source of something but not have authority over it. But someone could be the source of something and also the boss and also preeminent, like maybe the founder of a company is the source of that company and then the most preeminent, they're the public figure of it and they have authority over that thing, they're the the boss of the thing. But there's a Venn diagram of understanding in those words. He'll go on to write, In the Lord, however, woman is not independent of man and man is not independent of woman. For just as woman came from man, so man comes through woman and all things come from God. What he's doing here is, he is highlighting a particular relationship. In fact, you're, if you're reading along in your Bible, uh, it might not say man and woman. They might have kind of done the work for you. It might say husband and wife. It's not talking about men and women generally. It's specifically talking about a particular relationship. Uh, uh, as we'll see in a couple weeks as well. Um, in the church generally, we're talking about elders and everyone. And in the family, we're talking about husbands and wives. So whether, whether or not uh, you believe it's source, preeminence, or authority will actually give you, know, give you very different um, applications of how do we live this out. Even people who agree on one of those interpretations, like uh, that it is head means there's a, a kind of authority, um, there are, like uh, I've shared, last time I preached on a, a passage about gender roles, I shared this study that said... Uh, One of the relationships, one of the male-female relationships that is the most likely to lead to an an abusive relationship is a very conservative Christian family. But the least likely to, to feature a domestic violence situation or abusive situation is also a very conservative Christian family. And so you have this kind of horseshoe of extremes where you have uh, a patriarchal approach on one end which says, well, the the man is the boss of the woman. The husband is the boss of the wife. And it's been used to cover over and to egregiously treat women. But they will call themselves conservative Christians. And on the other end, you have people who might also call themselves conservative Christians, uh, which has among the least, it's the most, it's the least likely 
relationship to have abuse or domestic violence. Who would also call themselves conservative Christians and also look at this passage and say there's authority there. Interestingly, this is not, when we're talking about head coverings, some people think it's a veil, some people think it's hair, some people think it's a, like a head scarf, something like this. Uh, it's really not about the fashion. It's not about the, the specific, like what, what, I'm, what I don't want to do is chase down all of those different things. I just want to preach what I think it's saying. It's not about fashion, but the early church has external signs that denote a spiritual reality. So what I don't think he's saying is if you're, if you're a man and you're in a church gathering and you're wearing a hat, you're dishonoring God. But in that culture, that had a meaning. It signified something that it doesn't signify today. What we want to do is we want to maintain what it signifies, even if culturally the sign itself doesn't signify that thing anymore. So the head coverings here, I think, are a visual representation of a spiritual reality, and that is specifically that the husband, every husband, has a particular responsibility before God for his wife and his family that the wife and kids don't. And that elders have a particular responsibility for the church in their, in their care that nobody else in the church has. It's a particular responsibility before God this is why James, right, Jesus' brother, writes, not many of you should be teachers. The teachers are going to be treated, judged more harshly. That's why Peter writes, <clears throat> uh, the elders among you will have to give an account for you. So, so please, please help them. Help, help, them to, help them to do a good job because they're going to have to give an account for you. This is why Paul harks back to creation right here. And he says, remember when Eve believed the deceiver and ate the apple. When God comes to Adam and Eve, what does he say? He says, he goes to Adam. Adam had a particular responsibility for his bride that Eve did not. It's not that she wasn't culpable for her own sin, but that Adam has a particular responsibility for his family. Sin entered through one man, Paul tells us, Adam. One man. He, he was the one who had the particular responsibility. What it's not saying is, is that men are better teachers. It's not saying men are better prophets or prayers or leaders. I mean, Adam, the first man, not a good leader. He did not... He didn't lead well. Interestingly, the, this passage in, in um, chapter 14, people use this to say, well, women, men should be in authority in the church and so women shouldn't. But here it's, it's assuming that women are, pray, are praying and prophesying publicly in the church. Now, I'm in the camp that believes that when Paul says prophesying, the closest analogy in our day is the public proclamation of the word. It's, for, it's foretelling or forthtelling. So prophecy, we tend to think it's telling something that's going to happen in the future. It's like a prophetic is like about the future. Um, but it's also about just proclaiming truth. And so Paul here, I think he's saying, when women get up to proclaim truth, they should have a symbol of authority. And culturally for them, that was the head covering. This, this particular responsibility, it's part of God's order, continues into the New Testament, continues to today. So if, you, if you're a man, you have a wife. This, this is very important. I know we are, it feels like maybe we're skimming over this, but we're going to, like I said, spend more time in it very soon. But the headline is you have a particular responsibility for your household. Doesn't mean you're a better leader. Doesn't mean you're smarter. Doesn't mean you're more intelligent. Doesn't mean you're going to have good ideas. Doesn't mean you get to control the remote or the purse strings. It means you have a particular responsibility before God. 
Doesn't mean you're even, doesn't even mean that you're closer to God. Again, Paul says functionally, men and women are doing the same kinds of things in the church, in his example here. He's saying, but there's a particular spiritual reality. And he says, in his church, in fact, in all the churches in the day, that had a particular denotation. This is why the scripture writers go out of their way when talking about husband and wife relationships to remind the husbands that their wives are co heirs with Christ, co laborers, co heirs, ontologically, so in essence, equal, equal before God, not better, not boss, co laborers. Peter goes out of his way, he says, Man, we. With the priesthood of all believers, all with direct access to God. It's not like husbands are mediators for their wives to God. It's, n- it's nothing like that. There are some other reasons given here as well. He says, a man should not cover his head because he is the image and glory of God. And so, again, Scripture tells us women are made in the image of God as well. So Paul here is just appealing to creation. So we'd see that prototypical husband and wife Adam and Eve, where Adam bears the responsibility, a particular responsibility for his family. And then he goes on and says, a woman should have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. This one's a little bit more tricky. And there are a range of views on this verse. What does it mean that women should have a symbol of authority, visible representation of a spiritual reality because of the angels? The first thing, The first thing that I think is the most striking about this verse is it assumes that there are angels here in our gatherings. Paul doesn't make a big deal out of it. He's not saying, well, we should focus on the angels because there are these angelic spiritual beings, messengers from God among us. He's not trying to focus on them. We have like God himself, the Holy Spirit is here with us, right? So so like we could say, well, we have the Holy Spirit, but we're going to focus on angels. Uh, every angel in Scripture always says, don't focus on me, focus on him. But it's still interesting that, that we are here and the angels are also here. Some people take this to mean, this is to kind of harken back to Genesis 6 and say, well, somehow a woman's sexy hair is going to cause angels to sexually stumble. I don't think that's what it's saying. Others say, well, these are just earthly Messengers, that's what this word angel means. It's really just a messenger. It's a, it's a role. So not all spiritual beings in the heavenly host are angels, although we kind of use these words synonymously. Angel is more like a role. It's a messenger. So some of those spiritual beings sent from God will have a message and they are the angels because that's what angels do. They're messengers. And some of them aren't messengers like the ser- seraphim and, and so on. So it's maybe they're just people. I don't, think that's, I don't think that's it either. Certainly, there are messengers from God among us, and some of them are your brothers and sisters who you see, and some of them are angelic from God. So what does it, so what does it mean about hair coverings? Uh, I don't think it matters in each of those situations, really, which, which one of those he's talking about, or it might be something that we don't know about. Whatever it is, what he's saying here is there is some consideration we need to have in our gatherings about how we adorn ourselves or how we denote our authority, how we denote our relationships together that has a significance in the spiritual realm. That's, I think, the, the, the basic thing that Paul is trying to say here. He's talking about a physical representation of a spiritual reality that has significance in the spiritual realm. So what does this mean for us? It means husbands, we can't shirk our responsibility. One of the things that, I mean, Adam tried to do this, right? The very first husband tries to do this. He says, oh God, the woman that you gave me, uh, she didn't do what she was supposed to do and now we're in this big mess. But he holds Adam the responsible one because he was the one responsible. He had the particular responsibility. So instead of trying to mitigate it, this particular responsibility that we have, uh, instead we should and need to, as people who belong to Jesus, embrace 
this particular responsibility. We would say, okay, I have a particular responsibility in my household for my wife and kids if you have them. If you look at places like Ephesians 5 where uh, Paul says something similar to this and he says, just like Jesus and his bride, the church, Jesus' goal is to present his bride pure and spotless. He says, likewise, husbands love your wives, laying down your life for her. So again, it's not about I'm the boss, I'm up here, I'm the man, what I say goes. It's, a, it's the inverse of that. So I'm laying down my life so that, so that you might see Jesus more clearly. And that we'll have a particular responsibility before God for how we live, how we live like that. Our culture, exact opposite of this. Exact opposite. Uh, the 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 particular responsibility of husbands for wives has been all but kind of bled out of our culture. If anything, like um, I, my daughter was singing a song yesterday, uh, which you know was really cute, made for made for young girls, and it, it was essentially you're just repeating the line, "The world's ours now," made for kids. Like, girls, we're on top. We did it. We beat the dudes. We beat the men. I'm like, holy moly, man. We, we are so evidently and obviously made for one another. Not just in Scripture, but Paul appeals to nature. He says, you can see in nature we need each other. And one of the ways we'd bring God dishonor, like Paul's saying here is, if we just buy into what our culture is selling and say, well, yeah, uh, over the last 50 years, a lot of good has come from uh, elevating women from where they were culturally before. Lo- lots of good has, has come from that. What we don't want to do is have a reaction to that where we say, well, no, men need to be the boss now and try to go back to like some 1950s style of operation. But rather we see what scripture says, co co-laborers, sons and daughters of the king, ontologically the same, and husbands with a particular responsibility. Let's embrace this responsibility. At the same time, we're embracing the follow me as I follow Christ. For men, here's another particular one. We say, well, okay, now I have a particular responsibility. What does that mean for me? And again, we're going to be doing that, looking into that over the next couple of weeks too. Wives, I'm not advocating for head coverings. I think that was a culturally contextual thing for the day. But I think that the spiritual reality that it pointed to is transcultural and a timeless truth. And for everybody else, not a husband or a wife, or in all of our other relationships, we're going to see again over the next couple of weeks, we're not discreetly compartmentalized atomistic individuals that come in and out of community as we desire, when we feel like it, for, to meet our own needs and then escape out again. We're actually, we are in a sense beholden to one another. We are, the love of God weaves our lives into the lives of each other. And, and as we do that, we have different roles and responsibilities with different people in our community, uh, but undergirding all of it is love. And so we, we, we have to understand how do we relate? Not just to God. It's not just me and God. And I can, it's just me and God. I can go out into the world and me and God and I can dip into community when I need it and dip out of community when I don't need it and dip into a marriage when I want and out of a marriage when I want or into a, a family when I want, out of a family when I want. One of the things that Paul's trying to help us understand, and again, you'll see next week. This week he's saying, I think you're doing this well. 
Next week he says, you are not doing this well. It's about the love they have for one another, which again, let's come back to where we started. To say, follow me as I follow Jesus means that we love like Jesus loves. There's no higher calling, no greater pursuit, nothing genuinely, there's there's nothing better you can do with your life than to love like Jesus loves. We need each other to do this. Can't love like Jesus loves, abstract of, God's family. So I know today's probably given you a lot more questions maybe than answers, um, but in our discipleship groups this week, and sorry if you're just a DG leader and freaking out right now, uh, we're gonna have a lot of help uh, for this. But again, when we get to chapter 14, we're gonna come back to here and show you how these two passages work really well together to help us understand uh, how do we live this out um, in in our world today. So uh, for now, let's pray that we're gonna lift up our hands, lift up our hearts, lift up our voices to the God who loves us once again. And so Father, I wanna thank you for, again, your goodness and your kindness to us in Jesus. They haven't left us um, groping about in the dark, trying to figure out how to live, but you've gifted us with these scriptures. And so would you please help us Help us have a greater view and perspective of the glory of Jesus. That he would be preeminent and prominent in our minds and in our lives. Help us have a greater understanding of his of, of your majesty and your love in him. Of your character of your will and your work in the world and our part in it. Help us to be a people who say boldly, follow me as I follow Jesus. It's not just for some to do, but for all to do. That we live those kind of lives laid bare so that people can see your spirit at work in us, see the gospel applied in our lives, and that ultimately you'll be glorified among us. Father, we have uh, particular relationships and particular responsibilities and roles in those relationships. Help us to embrace these. Help us to embrace them in ways that are helpful for uh, our, our mutual flourishing. That we point one another to Jesus. Live as he'd have us live. And Father, that we invite others into the same kind of life. And Father, help us when we say, follow me, not to ever make ourselves the point or the focus, but that always we'd be pointing to you, proclaiming you, uh, even, even prophetically foretelling of your goodness, your grace, your love, the mercy you've shown us in Jesus. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Oh, and Father, one more thing, that that there be no hint of abuse or violence or subjugation. That this would be a community where our, our men and our women are flourishing and growing and leading and learning and and in every way bringing you glory with their lives. I want to thank you for the women in this church. I want to thank you for our many uh, ministry leaders who are women and for the amazing leadership they have in the church. I want to thank you for every mum and every dad, for those who have biological kids and for those who have taken responsibility for a family, not of their own, but of, but of yours. And Father, again, my request is that 
this would be a community where the banner over our family is love and joy and your glory. I pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.